Okay. Conrad is ready. I think so, yeah. Okay, cool. Maybe. Almost. We're still Almost. debating. Ooh, right in my face again. <laughs> mm. uh, all right, so let's build a concurrent non-blocking cache. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> uh, are you all set up on... Good, good. Yeah. We're online. We're live streaming still. And it's going really well, right? We've had no problems, no connectivity problems. Some of you remember what happened at Lyft a few months ago. Yeah, I know you do. All right, uh, round of applause for Conrad. Cool. Hi. Um, my name is Conrad, and I want to talk today about concurrent data structure design in Go. In particular, I want to build a uh, concurrent non-blocking cache. And the question really is, um, yeah, what, what is a cache to begin with? Um, a cache, I mean, concurrent non-blocking cache doesn't only sound very sophisticated, but it actually solves a real problem. Um, for instance, imagine we have a service. Service makes requests to a server, and that server, in order to compute the response, needs to call some slow function. So that's a very easy thing to optimize, right? So we can just use a cache and pre-cache the value and then deliver the results, which would make subsequent requests a lot faster. That's a very simple thing. And you could raise the question, why should I bother in building something like this? I mean, surely there are a lot of libraries out there who have already solved this, right? I mean, like code we use is a thing. And not invented here is, yeah, it's kind of a disease, right? I mean, it's fun to write your own code, but it's actually also really good to, to reuse code. And so, yeah, why should you not just go out there, pick a library which already implements this and use it? So there are actually a lot of things, um, and let me get a little bit into this. So for one is sometimes the lack of type transparency when you try to make uh, libraries and try to make them as generic as possible, but also um, accessing the underlying data. So let me explain this maybe a little bit. So for instance, given we have like this deck here, deck is a double ended queue, and since the library tries to be as generic as possible, uh, obviously the, the, the value it would accept would be the empty interface type. And the empty interface type is great. You can just pass everything to it, and, but it also tells you absolutely nothing. So every time you want to access the values, you need to do type assertion. So that's a little bit bothersome. I mean, after all, like nice thing about Go is static typing, so why give it up again? And if we want to be like very pedantic here, we should actually also check if the type assertion is successful. So these kind of things add up to libraries which try to be super generic. Another example is when you want to use it, for instance, for persistence. So let's say you make it as part of a struct and you want to persist it. And then you see that basically the default JSON marshalling doesn't return anything at all. And then you start investigating and you see, well, of course, there's nothing to be uh, nothing to be marshaled because uh, all the fields have not been uh, exported. So one easy solution would obviously be like start wrapping this data type again, trying to make the data you're interested in accessible in another way. But the thing is really, why should you reuse the library then in the first place if it doesn't really fit your need? In a way, I think where Go really shines is like writing code and making it very specific, capturing your problem solution. So I think that's actually a great reason to why you should know how to implement these things on your own. So yeah, let's jump straight into it um, and implement such a cache. And I want to talk a little bit about what kind of gotchas you need to look out for when dealing with concurrency. So let's start a new project and start implementing this cache. So, what we would have is our own cache struct, and we would store the values using a map. We use string keys, and we define the results in another struct. And that's actually a compound value because we want to return bytes, but also want to have the option to return optional errors. And then 
we want to allow, at least allow some flexibility, so we define function type which we can pass to the cache function, which then get used in order to compute the value. So then we need a constructor. Oh. That was welcome to the party. Okay. Um. So what do we need to do? We need to uh, instantiate the map. We can make a new map uh, result. Okay, so now let's get to the actual function of the cache. So we want to get something. The key defines uh, where the value should be stored. Yeah. Oh. Um. Better, yeah. Okay. Is it too small uh, in the back? How it looks. Okay. Cool. Um, so then return. Okay, that's a return signature. Okay, so um, when we get the value, what do we need to do? So we want to return the result. So we access a map. And we also need to check if we actually got a value. So we can use a second return value in order to check that if we are successful and the value has already been cached, we can immediately return it. And if not, we want to create a new result entry. And we assign the value now finally by actually calling the function. And then we can insert it. Okay, that should hopefully work. Um, let's check that actually. So I've prepared something here. Um, retrieve and actually cache test out of my magic box. Um, that cache test looks as following. So, um, in order to test this, we will use, so our slow function in this case will be an HTTP get body function. It basically will call a URL, will retrieve the body, will read it as a whole and return it. That's exactly what we want to cache. We have a list of URLs. These URLs are actually, there are actually four different ones and we will uh, retrieve them once more in order to test the, test the cache capabilities. And for that, we will run the test. And actually, we will begin with just a sequential test. Okay. So, uh, as we can see, basically here, um, these URLs have been retrieved. It took like millisecond up to a second, but you can see down here that actually nanosecond, so it, uh, it was a lot faster getting the, um, the same URL the second time. So that at least is working. Now, network IO is a classical example where you want to apply optimization, right? You want to run it concurrently. So uh, we have, we look at the test again. I've written uh, test concurrent, which will launch Go routines to uh, basically call all of the URLs at once, launch eight Go routines, and then they all compete for each other for the cache. So let's try this. Okay, so this was a lot faster to begin with, but we can see that like, even though some of them has been retrieved second time, it took a bit longer. Um, if you know a little bit about concurrency, like we sh it should be obvious that like we didn't apply any synchronization whatsoever. A uh, great way always to check like if there are synchronization issues is to uh, supply the um, hyphen raise command to either your go test or um, you can also compile your go binary with this addition. And that one will check for race conditions. OK. 
Okay, this didn't work. So this is actually uh, in, in a way good that that happened because minus rays can detect race conditions, but it can't prove the absence of those. So it should, you should, when you use rays, you should definitely make it part of your continuous integration chain because sometimes it could be uncovered, sometimes it couldn't. Oh, actually, now it worked. So here we got a data race. And if we now look in, we see cache line 23 and another ride as well in line cache 23. So basically, go routines are running, trying to write back the same value for the same URL into this line. So how do we apply synchronization? I think the easiest solution is always we just serialize the axis. We add a mutex. And what's very common is basically then to lock at the beginning. And then it's also very idiomatic idiomatic to call unlock right after with defer so we don't forget. So that should have fixed it, but on the other hand, we're applying quite coarse locking. So running this, it's, I mean, the speed is okay, but like it's, it's still not that good because we're basically, this is called monitor-based synchronization. The whole function is being is being locked, and in a way, this is exactly a blocking cache. And let me now actually go shortly into detail what the difference between a blocking cache and a non-blocking cache is. So while a blocking cache, um, when you get a uh, get a miss after a cache request, the cache must wait for the result of the slow function, and until then, is blocked. That's bad, right? Basically, want something which is like a non-blocking cache. A non-blocking cache on the opposite has the ability to work on other requests while waiting for the result of the function. And we can achieve this quite easily. I mean, in a way, you never want to like block the whole section of the code you want to synchronize, but only the critical section. The critical section is that part where resources are shared. So in that sense, we want to log around here because here we are accessing the cache. And we want to log around here when we write back. So as we can see, this has improved speed quite a bit. A lot faster now if we compare the numbers with before. Um, there's still another gotcha. So maybe to make this visible, let's go in here and actually print uh, the URL which is being fetched, which should really only happen like four times. But if we make this visible, then we can see that like some, or I think even all of the URLs are still being fetched twice, right? This is not great. Like, I mean, yes, we want speed improvement, but at the same time, we also don't want additional network I.O. because that's also the point. We become much more resilient if we like reduce any, any kind of I.O. So the next optimization to this cache would be called duplicate suppression. And in order to achieve that, we can actually make use of channel. Um, so for that, we need to change the whole structure a little bit. Um, we will introduce a new type called entry. And entry will actually wrap the result. And will also hold a channel uh, of the empty struct. Uh, having a channel with the empty struct is basically a convention in Go. If you just want to use this channel for signaling, basically a signal only channel which doesn't transport anything, but which we'll, we'll just use for broadcasting things. The other advantage is that channel of the empty struct also compiles to zero bytes, so that's actually quite handy. Okay, so we changed the general structure here. Um, we will just get rid of all of this here so I don't confuse myself. So we begin again by locking because, again, at the same time, we want to see, we get a GET request in, and we want to check, is this already there? And then we need to check, well, has this entry been created in the first place? And if it hasn't, we will create a new one. And now we need to make the ready channel.
and we will store it immediately in the cache. So we are doing a writing operation, so it's good that we still have uh, the lock. Now we can unlock. And um, no, let's finish this first. Okay, so uh, now we actually want to uh, insert, basically call our slow function. So the entry has already been created. Uh, it's already in the cache, but at the same time, it's not accessible until we. Close the ready channel to signal that the value has been computed. So basically, if we get a GET request in and the entry is not nil, then that doesn't mean that the value has been computed yet, but that maybe has been computed, but at least that something is in progress. So what we want to do is we want to wait on ready condition to, uh, to happen. And Actually, we can unlock right after here, because we're not doing any operation. And when it is ready, well, in that case, we can then actually return the results. OK, um, let's check this. OK, it's 20, 21. OK, most importantly, what we can see here is now every URL is now only being fetched once. And that's exactly what we wanted. So that's basically a combination of lock. So we still have monitor-based synchronization in order to access the map. But at the same time, we're also using a channel to signal and transport that communication value by waiting on it. So what's important to point out here is that's just one way to implement it. There are a couple of other goals you can have on this kind of design, just to show you Something else, um, you could also replace um, this monitor-based uh, synchronization by just using a lock. You could just use channels, right? Because you can implement logs with channels and vice versa. And just to give you an example of how that could look very different, uh, cache, which is just done with um, monitor-based solution, uh, with panel, um, which is basic, where the map is basically uh, found by a channel monitor. So the cache now doesn't have a map anymore, but instead it has a channel of incoming requests. A request uh, contains a key. It contains a channel for the result. The entries are still the same. And in addition now, when we create a cache, we also start something called cache server. And what does get now? Get basically creates a new response channel and makes that response as part of the request, sends it down the request channel, and then we'll wait for the response to be calculated so it can return it. So now all the meat is actually inside the server function. What happens here? So now, as you can see, actually our cache is now confined within a Go routine which is constantly running over new incoming requests. And then the code is quite similar. We check if there's already an entry. If not, we create a new one. We put it into the map. Then we make call, which is basically the code we've seen before. It's calling the function. Then it gives a signal that everything is ready. And then it falls through to entry deliver and entry deliver does the same as before, it waits on the channel to be ready and then sends the result down the response channel. The go statement here is important because otherwise it would just block and no other requests could be processed. So this should give like, like quite, a, quite a different take on how you could also structure the synchronization. I think a lot of people come to go uh, when they start using it and get to learn to use the channel as a concurrency primitive. They, they start to use it a lot because it's just very handy and it's uh, in a way also very simple to use. But um, I think depending on the problem you're solving, sometimes a different uh, concurrency solution can capture your problem much, much better than, uh, than a different one. So it's good actually to now 
how they work differently together. And so there are a couple of other things um, to look into. Like this is just the beginning, right? If you think about it, you also want to have like an actually an expirable cache. So the keys you put in there should have a time to live. So you could in addition also add um, cleanup go routine, which basically runs over those. And in, in my work, as, as I've implemented these kind of things, you will notice that there, the more you add, the, the more interesting it becomes. So maybe just one really interesting gotcha, which can be quite mean, is the following. Let's imagine, because usually like your slow functions are not always as simple as that, but let's imagine one of these methods would panic. And let's say we only want this to happen on this URL here, actually. Right, so, and then addition, we need to modify the test a little bit, because if it would notice a uh, panic, it would just bubble up immediately uh, in a real, well, problem that wouldn't quite occur, the Go routine would just panic and your server would still continue. So if we check this now, then what happens basically is it retrieves um, one of the URLs the first time and then it will panic which crushes, uh, crashes the Go routine, and then the second time it tries to retrieve that value because it requests it again, it just blocks forever. And that's actually quite, quite mean if that happens. So, and if you think about it, like, what happens here? So basically, here the function is called, right? And if it crashes there, it just dies, and it never reaches this point. So that should really never happen, so in a way, what you want to do here is, I think that's actually a great use of um, recover, where you can recover from, from panics. So if that happens, you know, you want to basically clean up the mess you left behind. So let's see if that actually fixes it. Okay, so here it could pass it. I mean, in general, you should also rethrow the panic, but I hope you get the gist. Um, yeah, okay, to recap, basically, um, you can use uh, the minus race to uncover data races. Um, definitely should be part, um, at least in my opinion, of your continuous integration chain because there will always be code edited which might not be as bulletproof as you think it is. And these thing can definitely uh, harm your production system as well because they might not be obvious in the first place, but can happen later. Um, then I showed you monitor-based synchronization by using mutex. Um, didn't talk about read-write mutex, uh, mutexes, but you can also use them. For instance, you can, if you're just reading, you can just use reading logs. Then we improved the solution again by using something called duplicate suppression by using a signal-only channel. So in addition, we use the channel to communicate. And I also showed you the alternative design confining a map just using a monitor go routine solely with channels. I think the important part here really is there's like a very, very uh, strong variety of different solutions and it's really interesting to explore them, all these different, because depending on the solution you're picking, um, can be, the expressiveness can, can vary a lot and like based on that can also reduce the cognitive load a lot. Okay, thanks.